Okay, good morning, uh, no, good morning, good evening, guys. Uh, thanks for joining us for our fifth uh, session for the Fundamentals of Orthopedics teaching series. Uh, we've got three excellent speakers lined up for you tonight, um, who Mr. J. Seal and our chair is gonna be introducing shortly. Um, I'm gonna be moderating for this evening, so a few ground rules for tonight. Um, please have your cameras off and your microphones off. We are gonna be recording the session. This will be uploaded at some point onto the website, so keep an eye out for that if Anyone else, anyone else you know wants to see it and unfortunately missed tonight. Um, and please complete the feedback forms at the end so we can count that you've actually attended the session and then eventually get your certificates out to you at the end of this series. Um, lastly, questions, we're gonna answer all of them uh, sort of as a panel at the end of the session. So please just drop your questions in the box, in the chat box. And what I'll do is I'll sort of collate them together and we'll ping them at the panel uh, at the end of this session. Uh, handing over to Mr. Jay Seelan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Seb. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Fundamentals series. I think we're on session five now. So we're just doing a slight um, kind of departing from the core knowledge ortho bit. And we thought we'd take the opportunity to delve into the ST3 recruitment process. The idea behind this is that you've still got six months before, uh, or five or six months before the application process as a whole begins. So you've got plenty of time to change a few things if required. Um, we've got a great session for you today. Uh, and we're going to be following this up with some interview specific sessions closer to the actual interview dates in whatever form they take. So today we're really lucky to have Zara Jaffrey, who is an ST3 on the Percival Pot Rotation. Um, she's going to be talking to us about the um, self-assessment forms. We've got uh, Simon Fleming, who's uh, um, an ST registrar on the Percival Pot Rotation as well. I'm sure you've all heard of him, big time educationalist, and he's going to be giving us um, some insight into the actual interview process. Uh, and finally, we've got Mr. Prim Achan, who is uh, TPD of the Percival Pot Rotation um, and one of my mentors over the years. And he's going to be giving us um, a bit about the um, um, TPD's perspective and then finally we'll do a panel at the end and we can blast some questions at these guys as well so without further ado let me hand over to Zara um, and she's going to take us through self-assessment you're on mute oh. yeah <laughs> okay just checking everyone can see that yeah, looks good. Yep, good. Okay, great. So uh, my name is Zara. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to talk to you mainly about the self-assessment questionnaire, as uh, Mr. J. has said, but um, just to start off, I'm going to give you an idea of what the last application cycle was, including a quick idea of the dates. So we've got the Oriel application uh, going live on their website between November and December last year, and then interviews happening in March, offers being released in May. Um, just for you to know that these dates can change, but are likely to stay the same. In terms of what I did to prepare, that's the timeline running across the bottom. I did start preparing my portfolio and started filling out the self-assessment questionnaire quite early on, um, just so that I'd had time later on to focus on the interview. Um, so just coming to that then. My portfolio, I actually ended up buying a new lever arch file. I filled it in with dividers, which you can get online with the actual headings for the self-assessment questionnaire as well. Um, so that was all, all quite easy to organize, but the, the costs do start racking up depending on how much you want to spend on this. And I put those at the bottom there for you. Just to give you an idea of how I did set it out, um, I'd put my CV at the front and then I'd put uh, supporting evidence for the ST3 application second and that included the application form. The self-assessment questionnaire checklist that they go through, I actually put right at the front before the CV. Then evidence for questions one to 10 throughout the folder and then just other evidence interests included pictures of me doing hobbies and things to show that I was more of a well-rounded person. I had interests outside of medicine and surgery. So where can you find the self-assessment questionnaire? 
if you go through to the Yorkshire and Humber Deanery website, you can actually get through to this link if you just type it, type in in Google SD3 TNO applications, and it will, it's the first link. They've got really useful documents on the side, on the right side of that website, um, including the self-assessment uh, checklist, the scoring guidance, um, and a few other things there, including the applicant handbook. So just to run through that assessment questionnaire briefly, I just wanted to draw your attention to question one, which has changed since the, since the time I'd applied. So the top box is from the year I applied and you can see there, the question is, by the end of July, 2020, your completion of core training, how many months would you have spent in total in any job in medicine post-foundation program? So you can see that um, it's got a list of numbers, to, towards the side on the right. Um, and that number isn't a score, it's just uh, some, a number that will be used to decide your weighting for other questions later on. And so I'll, I'll show you those questions and how the weighting is done. Uh, as you can see, question one is now changed um, because of COVID. The time intervals are a lot bigger, so you can get a, a lower, assigned a lower number um, if you've taken a year out. Uh, because of being disadvantaged because of COVID and you've had to reapply, essentially. So whether or not this will still be the case next year, I'm not sure, um, but it is just something to keep in mind. So the table on the left here, I've um, just put in what the maximum score is that you can get um, and what you need to get that. Uh, and then on the right, you can see what I put down as my the self-assessment um, checklist that comes up that you need to fill in to put at the start of your portfolio. And that was the way I'd filled mine in. So just to go through it briefly, question two talks about post-informal and orthopedic surgery. Um, so that's 10 to 42 months will give you your maximum point of eight. If you go above or below that time interval, your scores start to go down. Then post and allied uh, surgical specialty, you'll get maximum points of two if you have four months in two of these rotations, and that includes plastics, neurosurgery, vascular, ENT, cardiothoracics, a &E, ITU, urology, max vax, peds, or general surgery. Um, then logbook, you need 12 or more extra capsule and off fixations, either with the, your supervisor scrubbed or unscrubbed. Um, publications as a first author will be two per paper, non-first author one per paper, national international presentations one per paper, and then audits or quips are one per cycle. So if you've done a closed loop audit, you'll end up with two points. So just focusing on five to seven, the way in which it's, you're going to get scored for this, I put a table at the bottom and that's from their, um, that's from their scoring guidance essentially. You, the number you would have been assigned at question one, that is the number that those points are divided by. Um, so you can only score a maximum of eight points, two points and two points for questions five to seven. Um, then moving on, question eight, uh, you can get a maximum of two points for a higher degree. So that's a PhD or MD. You'll get one point if you have a master's. Formal leadership role will give you a maximum of two points. Formal qualification in teaching, one point. Regularly engaged in teaching, one. So again, for all of these things, you'll need to show that you've got evidence for all of them. And that's what your portfolio is there to show. Um, just another thing for you to be aware of is that in my year, the, the minimum score you needed to be able to get an interview was 21. I've been told that last year it was 19. So that number will change year on year. The way in which you can try and be efficient about it, if you are starting to worry that you haven't got enough points to make it, is, you know, you can think that uh, you won't be able to get a higher degree. Um, it may be too late to try and get a publication in, but, you know, you have plenty of time to try and get um your presentations and uh, to try and get audits and quips done and those will get you plenty of points too. It's also never too late to get involved in teaching and uh, getting scores up for your logbook. So just to end with a final few points, um, I know Simon's going to talk to you a bit more about the interview but I thought I'd just let you know um, Register really early for interview courses because the fast the places go up really quickly. Um, so I started looking from September onwards, really. 
Um, but then keep checking because they can be released as late as January and you really don't want to miss out. Those can be really useful. Um, but like Mr. Jersey said earlier, you, there will be another one running through um, Fundamental Orthopaedics. And so that's one to look out for. And then again, online question banks, sign up for those early. I did um, start looking at those from January onwards because that's a, a good amount of time for me but some people might need longer or less time and so I actually you can see that the costs are really racking up over there on the side but that was because I'd signed up for both but I don't think you necessarily need to do that um ortho prep and ortho interview were the main one main ones I'd hired up of but they actually overlap quite a bit so if you just go and um, have a go at the trials that they have available on their websites, see which format works for you. I liked author interview personally just because of how much detail they had in the feedback, but everyone's different. So, so definitely have a look into that. And that's everything I had to say. Uh, there'll be lots of opportunity for questions towards the end. So um, I'll, I'll look forward to answering all of those then. Thank you. Shall I kick straight off? Yes, please, let's do it. Cool. Um, good evening, my name's Simon Fleming. I'm a orthopedic registrar on the pot rotation currently at the Royal London. Um, and um, I've been asked to kind of talk a bit more about the interview process. Um, the main reason for that is not only have I been through the interview process like, like um, a couple of people on this call, but uh, uh, credibility wise when I did some trainee leadership work I was some of one of the trainee reps that helped design and deliver national selection so I've sort of seen behind the curtain saying that um, ideally my talk isn't going to be a fig jam talk so fig jam stands for fuck I'm good just ask me uh, and instead I'm gonna try and just share with you what the day is like and what the experience is like and and, and without you know breaking the rules give you some kind of hints and tips and, and ways to think about things um the first thing to say is at the moment um they still haven't decided whether the next lot of interviews is going to be virtual or face-to-face -face. that is still very much up for debate so um one of the things i loved about zara's presentation and it's something i would keep in mind is it, it, many people will look at, at what zara presented and be like wow that's that's pretty full on. But actually, I would I would fully endorse that. You can prepare for certain things and you can't prepare for other things. But you know that they're probably going to ask for some form of portfolio, whether it's face to face or virtual. So there's still no better time than to start getting stuff ready now, sooner, the better. We know that last year, about 600 applications were received. Um, and that the self-assessment process where they go through your portfolio, last year it was virtual, about 560, 570 something applicants had their self-assessments uh, gone through. Of those 500 and something, 550, 60, 70 applicants who, who were self-assessed, we know that 300 and something were found to be, you know, appointable. And then the the kind of interview process went forward and and um 170 177 178 numbers something like that uh were were put out there and were accepted now whether you go to the virtual interview or the or the face-to-face -face interview the, the principle is the same which is that which is there are a certain number of stations um if it's face-to-face -face, um it's Kind of a big undertaking uh previously it's always been at uh, a big football stadium so you walk in you're checked in they check your documents they check your id you get a little name badge the kind of hi my name is um certainly if it's face to face uh top tip um think about what you're going to wear um make sure that you've got some spares so by that i mean make sure that you've got a spare shirt a spare blouse a clean pair of shoes maybe even a spare pair of shoes all that sort of stuff um i think every year i went to interview there was at least one person sat in the waiting room with coffee down their front looking mortified and and it's nerves it's all nerves similarly if it's face to face 
I would endorse you um, booking a hotel, wherever those interviews are. Um, if it's virtual, less of a problem. Make sure your connectivity is good and your Wi-Fi is good and your laptop isn't going to decide to update to a new operating system in the middle of, of something or what have you. Uh, again, face-to-face -face, every year, there's been at least two or three people who have called up and said, um, yeah, my, my car is broken down. Can I, can I be interviewed tomorrow, please? And, and the answer is no, it's a really tight schedule. And to be fair, the virtual is just the same. You know, if you, if you can't make that virtual interview, it's going to be really, really difficult for them to accommodate you otherwise. Um, Zara really nicely touched on the self-assessment process. Uh, last year it was virtual. So you, you know, you submitted stuff um, and it was, you scored yourself and then your evidence was reviewed. In the face-to-face -face version, it's normally a 10-minute station. The first uh, five minutes um, are is someone going through your portfolio, checking your evidence, seeing what you've got, what you've brought to the party, making sure that the score you've given yourself is accurate. They will mark you up as well as down, but, and this is a top tip for life, don't bullshit. So um, a really great example is... Um, you know, Zara there had the self-assessment criteria for, you know, number of months in the job. Um, if it says, how many papers have you published and you submit a paper that's been accepted, I promise you that the team are there and, and I used to be part of this team and they're Googling, they're on PubMed. And if, if, if you've not actually published that paper, if you've not actually got that degree or you've not quite graduated yet, if you don't have it, don't have it. Don't be afraid to, to big yourself up. Don't be afraid to be proud of your achievements and go, you know what? I did do that leadership role and it was national and I do have evidence for it. But if it wasn't really national and it wasn't really a leadership role, the team will see through that. And it's not, it's not a great look, is what I would say. Similarly, if you're going to have a real physical portfolio, just be aware of um, patient identifiable data. Uh, most years we find um, thank you cards. Oh dear, Simon, you're just the best. Lots of love, so-and-so, age something at something hospital. Um, equally, uh, if you're going to bring, for example, your audit to, to interview and you're going to show us that you've done an audit and it's great, don't have the data set in the folder with you. Um, again, it's patient identifiable. Um, and we will not look kindly on that sort of stuff. We understand it's normally nerves and all the rest, but it is what it is. The second half of the portfolio station then gets into kind of um, uh, the more questiony bit of interview, the bit that you kind of feel more like this is an interview. So that's when they'll say a question, normally for five minutes, and they will ask you something topical. So um, an example from a couple of years ago was in light of winter pressures, uh, how are you going to take responsibility for your training? And, you know, those stations, they're not about right and wrong answers. Obviously, some things are wrong. If you're like, well, I'm just going to operate on people in waiting rooms, then not a great look. But generally, it's about a thoughtful answer um, that clearly shows that you've got some good examples, good knowledge of what it is to be a good trainee, a good member of the team, you're aware of the curriculum, you think about the wider team, all that sort of stuff. And obviously, because it's a portfolio station, you refer back to your portfolio. So for that station, you might say, look, um, I would speak to my program director and I would say, look, this is what's going on. What do you think of this? As evidenced in my portfolio, where I've shown that I speak to my program director regularly. And if there were trauma lists going, I would go to a trauma list. And as evidenced by my great logbook. And if there weren't trauma lists because of the winter pressures, I might do some other projects as evidenced. Do you see what I mean? We're, we're looking to give you points, but we can only help you if you help us. The next station you'll commonly see is, oh, weird feedback, uh, is the clinical station. The clinical station stresses a lot of people out. It's, again, it's not an exam. The, the interview is designed to see, to kind of be a bit like a, a day at work, a bit like the MRCS really. So the clinical station, there's a clinical scenario and it will be something common. 
you know, the the days of um, please draw the blood supply to a vertebral body just isn't isn't a thing anymore. Common scenarios come up time and time again. And it's about exploring your knowledge of anatomy, but then exploring your knowledge of the job of orthopedics. What would you do with it? How will you think about this? And all the time, the examiners are, are grading you on, you know, from basically red flag, what they've said is, is dangerous. There's concerns about probity, safety, all the rest, up to, up to an outstanding, which is exceptional. Uh, great knowledge, great communication, great, great consideration of all the information that they've been given. You know, everything is, is what you would look for in a good trainee, a safe and sensible trainee. And if they're asking you about a clavicle fracture or a broken wrist, they're not expecting a rock star. They're not expecting you to, to have read every single paper and do some experimental operation that you heard was done once in the Mayo Clinic. They're expecting a safe, sensible answer backed up by good evidence and communicated in a way that is clear and responsive to all the kind of uh, information and verbal and nonverbal cues and all the other sort of stuff they've they've given to you one of the things that's really interesting is um and it's something that it, you know examiners talk about a lot as well as interviewers is your pace at which you speak at and so um nervous speakers tend to talk really quickly and they blah, 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 blah. and actually if you start preparing and give yourself enough time what you'll find is that actually your speech pattern slows down, but you still get the same amount of information across. And so the examiner just gets to sit there and listen to you talk about the brachial plexus or quarter equina or whatever that has come up there. And rather than desperately trying to pick out the magic words, it feels more like a registrar in a trauma meeting, more like a registrar talking on the phone. The next station you'll probably encounter is the prioritization station. That is, as you might imagine, what it says on the tin. It is about you showing your clinical reasoning. It is about you demonstrating that you can problem solve and make decisions. And again, a great registrar is going to be logical. You're going to identify what the problems, plural, are, what resources you have to work with. You're gonna think critically about what are your options? Does a diabetic go first or does the child go first? Um, do I have all the equipment for this? Do I need plastics to come in for that open fracture? So maybe I might start with something else if they're not available. Um, and you're safe, decisive, and you give them an outcome that sounds like a sensible, safe outcome. I would do the neck of femur, then I would do this, then I would do that, and this is why. Um, Equally, you can get a red flag if you're like, well, none of it really matters, you know, so long as I get my operative numbers, I don't care. And, and that then moves you on quite nicely into um, if there's a face to face uh, interview, the communication station. In the face to face, um, communication was always split in half information gathering and information giving, um, normally done with a, an actor. And again, the candidates that do well are safe, sensible trainees. They're doing what they do uh, on a normal day at their work and they are responding to the actor's cues. They're not saying anything heroic. They're not trying to be super dominant or super assertive or super confident. They're behaving like a trainee. Similarly, the, the ones who are less glamorous and score less highly tend to be one of two things they either tend to be indecisive and neither gather nor give information um, or they tend to try and act like they think a registrar should act and often that can come across as either quite aggressive or quite arrogant and that's a scary thing to see when you're you know, looking for future colleagues and people you want to be part of your team, part of your family, part of your rotation. The final station that you may or may not encounter, depending on whether it's face-to-face -face or virtual, is the practical skills station. 
people get really stressed about this. Things to know. Number one, the practical skills station, by, by the nature of the rules, um, can't test anything that isn't a core competency, right? So you're not going to be asked to do a total hip replacement, right? You're not going to be asked to do an Elizaroth frame or something insane. You can only really be asked to do the things that are within the core curriculum and those kind of expected things. So you all know the stuff that's come up before, like DHS and plating and all the rest. But don't forget that things like basic surgical skills and acute trauma life support are also core competencies. So people have in the past had their minds blown when they've been asked to tie a knot or put a stitch in something. But these are also things that as a registrar, you'd be expected to do. Um, in terms of kind of interview top tips, um, I will go back to the first one because it is a big one and it is about not lying. Don't be afraid to back yourself. Um, do not be afraid to look at your portfolio or look at your CV, ideally with your mentor or with some senior colleagues and go, is this legit? You know, sense check me. Am I, am I okay to say this? But don't be afraid to be proud of what you've done. Similarly, don't gild the lily. If your papers have not been published, don't claim they have been. If you are doing a PhD, but have not yet had your Viva and been awarded a PhD, don't claim you have one. Um, it's about scoring the most points you can legitimately, but the truth will out. Um, don't be afraid to practice. Go on the courses, find friends and colleagues and reach out, ask for advice. There are people out there like Mr. Achan, like Zara, like Lucky, like all of us who are more than happy to sit down with you and do some interview practice. Um, Recognise that, you know, you, are, you either win or you learn. So it's a really humbling experience, but take your portfolio into work, take your CV into work and ask people to take it to pieces. This isn't how I would lay this out. This isn't how I would structure this. Don't be afraid to fail in a safe environment so that by the time you get to your interview day, actually, it's just another day at the office. It's just another conversation. And remember that the people interviewing you, and I know this for a fact, they're not looking to catch you out. They are looking to find new colleagues who are going to be good, good to work with, good to take care of patients. Um, it's a tough process. So the national selection process previously has been taken to court and the judge's ruling basically said you are better off mi um, missing out a few good candidates than letting in some bad ones. So it is tough, but it is fair. So during the day, we have little breaks where people um, calibrate, which means that the interviewers stop during the day and all come together and have a bit of a chat. How are you scoring people? How are things going? Um, you know, are there any stations that are scoring really high or really low? And it allows them to go back and change their marks. So if they find out that they've been marking really harshly, they're allowed to go and bump people up. And similarly, if they find that they've been giving everyone full marks, they're allowed to bump people down. It's a really, really fair process designed to give the best people on the day the best shot at a job. And what I would say is good luck and I'll see you in theatres. Over to you, Mr. Achan. Okay, uh, sorry, so yeah, Mr. Achan will be coming up next. He's gonna be, he's the POTS rotation TPD and he'll be giving us the views of expectations of an ST3 and the views as a TPD. Thank you, Mr. Achan. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for asking me. Um, I think it's a great example of what can go wrong. I've just prepared a talk uh, over the last few days. And today, every time I try and play it, a big sign comes up saying, um, keynote has crashed, this won't work. So I'm gonna have to run it off like this. And I apologize for that. Um, so when these guys uh, asked me, firstly, I was slightly daunted by um, being asked to talk about the, a, a TPD's perspective on ST3 entry. But even more than that, I was uh, even more daunted by following Zara and Simon, who are two of my um, very best trainees. 
but I just want to stress, particularly in view of the fact that this is being recorded, that these are all very much my own views and um, my views are controversial generally. They aren't um, necessarily accepted by everyone, but I'm gonna give you a little rundown on what I think um, an SD3 needs to be. So what makes a good SD3, I love this, which is a, have the accuracy of a clock, the memory of a computer, knowledge of a scientist, and so it goes on, endurance of a long distance lorry driver, communication skills of a TV presenter, serenity of a true believer, and sociability of a generous host. It almost makes it think like, well, nobody I know could even be this person. Um, and probably uh, it's more realistic that we look for these qualities in what would make an ideal ST3. And you'll see there that I've got intelligence, professionalism, conscientious, conscientiousness, creativity, courage, perseverance, and empathy, of which probably intelligence is the only one that's not truly a soft skill uh, that we're able to evaluate at the interview process you've heard a lot about. I've also put those other pictures there because one of the big issues uh, that certainly was the case when I was at your stage looking to get into orthopedic training is that it was very old school. It was seen as a place for, for old public school boys. It was largely an old boys network. There was discrimination based on gender, based on race, um, you know, but the great news for you guys is that it's changed. And I can genuinely tell you, having got through that process and played some small part in, in, in driving that change, I now sit on things like the SAC, uh, the interview uh, design committee who I help. I don't, I'm not officially on that committee, but Mark Crowther chairs it. That, you know, all of these people are so driven to make sure that the process is fair that I don't think you guys have to worry uh, about uh, any of that. So I, I've been interviewing now for selecting SD3s onto our program. I, I was deputy program director for four years um, and have been training program director for 10 years now. So for 14 years, I've been involved in selecting people onto the training program. But at the start of that, it was not national selection. It was regional local selection. And we had interview panels made up of um, pan London consultants involved in training. And I have to say, it was a very rigorous and fairly random process. You had hawks, you had doves. Um, and the obvious negatives were there was a, a huge danger of both patriarchy in terms of, uh, of male dominance on the panels and the recruitment, but also of nepotism in terms of people who they knew or they knew people who knew who were selected. The positives, however, were that if you were able to eliminate those biases and genuinely choose good people, you were able to develop personality for your training program. You had the autonomy and freedom to be contrarian in who you selected, and you could actively police for diversity uh, into your own training program. Um, and that's, it might sound a bizarre thing to say, but once you move out of having any influence as a TPD into a national selection model, um, things change. So what, what is great about national selection, and you know, I, I mentioned Mark and Rob Gregory and all these guys who, deeper bows, they spend an awful lot of time, uh, uh, you know, that's not paid for, to work on getting a system that is fair, that is harsh in the nicest possible way, um, and that truly tries to select the best people who are out there. And there are a couple of questions coming on in the chat already about how is this fair and how is that not fair? But these guys are constantly evolving, you know, almost in real time, their selection criteria to make sure it's fair. So when we do the long listing to draw where that line that Simon talked about, you know, everybody is on the same MS Teams call or Zoom call and the senior design committee are sitting there. And if somebody flags something up, then it really is topical. So, you know, if COVID has played a part in, in making something a different score, then they give a very clear line so that there is consistency across the part. And you don't have one guy being arbitrary in his selection or one female consultant being, uh, you know, taking it in isolation as to how she's going to judge or he's going to judge a certain situation. The implication of that fairness is that it is a total lottery as to who I get as a TPD onto my program. Um, 
I can't then say I want this percentage of diversity of females. I end up basically taking the highest ranked people who chose my program. And so uh, what we've worked very hard on on my program is to make it appealing to people of all backgrounds, uh, but not of all abilities. We, we try and attract the best people and I'll explain why. Um, that isn't always a popular concept. People will say to me, if you're the best program, you should be taking the weakest people uh, and trying to make them as good as they can be or accept a total, totally random allocation. Um, but, you know, you could argue it either way. Um, I, I would say our program drives and strives to make everyone that comes into it the absolute best they can be, not just at a regional or national level, but on, a, on, a, on an international scale. I put interdeanery transfer there because it's a real bugbear of people now uh, having moved to national selection where people just look and strive to get a number. And even before they start, they then apply for an interdeanery transfer because citing family or whatever reasons. Um, and you have no idea how disruptive that is to TPDs and to regions. Um, and so expect some very hard rules to come and be, be held uh, too strongly uh, by TPDs and the SAC, as well as your local deaneries about interdeanery transfer and what makes up a good enough reason uh, to accept that uh, in somebody moving. Finally, I put what a TPD can do. So if a TPD gets uh, weaker trainees onto their program uh, or one or two um, trainees in difficulty, they suck up a huge amount of your time. And there is only a finite amount of time, especially if you're clinically involved, that you can dedicate. And what happens is, as a TPD, if you, if you can step back into that helicopter overview of how you run a program, you've got to spend time on strategically developing your program, as well as operationally firefighting. And certainly COVID has thrown up a lot of operational firefighting need. But if any program is going to continue to develop, uh, what it needs is a TPD who gets time to develop that strategy. And the two constraints are going to be what else sucks away his time or her time and also how long they get to spend as TPD. So having been 10 years as a TPD, I'm one of a handful of, of long term TPDs in this country. Uh, and what that has allowed me to do is really evolve my program to develop its own personality and strengths. And so. This is, this, this is true of any sort of leadership, is how you split your time between strategic leadership and operational leadership. And you can see people describe it as being operational leadership is all about doing things right. And strategic leadership is all about doing the right things. And you can see that one uh, requires a long term uh, approach. And that's the strategic piece. Uh, the other is very short term and works very conveniently for people who do three or five year term TPDs. Um, what do I look for ideally in somebody coming onto my program? It is, and I'm not embarrassed about this, I look to select the best people. Um, and there is no demographic for the best. You know, it's certainly, we all know, isn't uh, a public school boy with the right club tie who uh, played rugby for Saracens or, or one of those teams. It, it could be someone from any background. What I look for is their personality, their achievements to date, uh, but also how they interact with the people around them. Are they, are they people who are going to carry people with them or are they just looking out for their own interests? So I really like and embrace people who raise the standard of everyone around them. I think they make for great trainees. They make my program stronger, but more than anything else, they make for excellent consultant colleagues when they finish their training program. They're also willing to understand and take on the bigger challenge of bettering themselves rather than setting goals. They really constantly will take constructive criticism on board and make the best of themselves. And the other thing I strive to achieve on our program is this concept of is getting your consultant job the end of a long journey so that you can settle down? Or is it actually the start of your individual journey where you can start to do the things your way and achieve your ambitions and your dreams? Um, and I prefer people that are going to do that to come onto my program because it, it, it pushes them further. But equally, we have place for people who just want to settle down and have a good quality of life. 
So I put this on here because it's, it's hugely crucial uh, for me to get through to everyone. Uh, there is a difference between, uh, these are mathematical terms, the lowest common denominator and the highest common factor. The lowest common denominator is all about setting a standard that means you're good enough. And the highest common factor is really thinking about how brilliant can you be? And on our program, I almost say all of, all of what you require to CCT is a given. And I would expect everyone on every good program in the country to achieve that. Really to make you the highest common factor, it's not about getting those bare minimums, it's really about pushing your boundaries in certain arenas to be outstanding. And you have to remember that governance will always dictate that the responsibility of HEE and the SAC and most of the programs are always focused on setting the appropriate standard for the lowest common denominator because patient safety is crucial. And what they can't have is uh, either releasing people out into the public having been through a credible training program who are not safe for patients or equally those who have not met the standards to get through. Um, but if you can select the best people, then it gives you a chance to say, well, we're going to take all of that for granted. And all of my trainees will tell you we never take it for granted. They work very hard for it. But we do create time on the program for them to strive for, uh, for better. So um, you saw Zara's portfolio. But when, when you present people with a portfolio or your CV, you have to imagine that you're not there. Right. And this is a total reflection on all the effort that you've put in to date, all of those papers you've written, those on calls you did, the extra list that you came in to help in, all of that, nobody is going to see. All they're going to see is your portfolio of evidence. And so it's crucial that you get that to give some representation of all the effort you've put in to date. And, you know, she put some costings on there. Really, in the scheme of things, those costings are almost nothing if that's all that's going to represent you. And it's the same in a translation to what Simon said, if you come to a face-to-face -face interview, and I think it's highly unlikely because of the costings involved that we will go back to face-to-face, -to -face, um, but it may happen. Certainly the orthopedic community want it to happen, but how you present yourself is again, a reflection. Um, and I've, you know, I've sat there or I've had conversations offline afterwards with people who decided that they wanted to have their tattoo as being visible or their earring in or their nose stud in or whatever haircut they want to wear uh, on the day. Um, those are all very brave decisions. And certainly the culture is moving towards recognizing all of that. Once it's fully recognized, it won't have any impact until it is universally accepted then there are two things that would draw concern to me is you are taking a chance after putting all of that effort in that you are going to get uh, an interviewer who has an open mind and is visionary and knows that this is not what defines you or your ability to be a great surgeon. Or you're going to come across a panel where they feel that this was so important to you that you were willing to risk things in order to be yourself. Now, that can always be perceived as someone who's a risk taker, who's willing to put themselves ahead of the task in hand. And that isn't always necessarily a good quality that you want to come across. So we're all going to pray for the day. We've done a huge amount in, in diversity in terms of selecting people. But that individual statement uh, that you want to make rather than conforming at the interview and relying on all the other qualities that you will undoubtedly have, um, is a decision ultimately that's down to you, but I would still be cautious about having come through that system uh, as an outsider as I was then. Um, so these portfolios also will represent you through your professional career. So uh, develop them, not just in the clinical space, but in the research space, in the teaching space. And you know, as it becomes evident that there's going to be one, one mark for a post a postgraduate educational teaching degree, you will see that everybody then goes to do a PG cert and it devalues the PG cert as making you stand out. And that's something that you have to constantly think about in terms of where you're going to score points, but also make your portfolio look strong, even if you score the same mark. 
Um, I do a lot about leadership. Um, I teach a leadership course in conjunction with the King's Fund. I teach all my trainees about leadership. But sadly, developing a leadership portfolio that is super strong very early in your career can raise eyebrows and not be viewed um, for the strength that it undoubtedly is. So I'm slightly cautious. And the way I break up my leadership teaching is into three domains. One is leading yourself which I think is probably for everybody the most important. This is about your own well-being and your own, um, you know, uh, wellness, your, your, your direction of travel, uh, your contentment and your ambition. The next one is leading a team, which all of us have to do in some form or other, whether it be on a ward round, a trauma call, uh, an operating theater. And then leading in a system is, is, is much more about leading doctors and leading direction. That may not be for everyone. But I can tell you this, all of the great Fortune 500 leaders or any leader that you see as being amazing, Nelson Mandela, uh, Barack Obama, all of these characters, they spend the majority of their time developing the first domain, which is leading yourself. And the great thing for all of you guys is that is not seen as threatening on a portfolio. Uh, it is seen as insightful. So work, certainly at this stage, on developing your personal leadership portfolio because people won't see that as threatening and will see it as, as bettering yourself. Um, this is true for everyone, you guys and me. We, we live in a changing landscape. Um, it is continually changing. And again, there were some questions as to what happened last year. Is that going to happen next year? Nobody knows. It is changing underfoot. And by that, what I mean is literally week to week, uh, the, the places we work, the type of caseload we're seeing, the way the rotors are asked to work with COVID are all changing, but also the goalposts are being changed. Um, so, you know, if you are leaving a lot of the tick box uh, point scoring for the three months before the interview submission starts, then you're leaving that very, very, very short in terms of a time frame, as Zara pointed out, and the goalposts can get moved, um, which will leave you vulnerable. But also, and this is the real positive for all of you, the landscape is changing for opportunities, right? Uh, and many of you are coming up in an age of digital health and uh, entrepreneurship. And I think there are going to be phenomenal opportunities of that, for, for that uh, in your future careers. Um, so the question is, how, how do, if we create an environment as we try to and strive to on the Percival Pop program, how do trainees respond to that feeding? And there is no doubt that the best ones thrive. Uh, almost everyone achieves, but there is no doubt that the other two categories which are struggling and failing also exist. And this is where being in the right environment for people to identify it. Um, and you know, there's a paper, paper that's been published about ARCPs. And if you are having just gentle ARCPs that don't push you uh, to better yourself and present yourself and make yourself better on paper as well as how you come across, then um, it is very hard for people to identify that you are struggling and you are failing. And if they don't identify that, then it is almost impossible for them to help you. You know, everyone that has got into that stage, in my mind, knowing the selection process and knowing the portfolios and where we draw that line, are phenomenally bright, intelligent people who are able. But what is out of all of our control is uh, our personal situations and what life throws in front of us. And these situations constantly change and they can push you into that uh, category of, of struggling or even failing. But what I can say to you unreservedly on behalf of every TPD uh, in the UK is that they want to know, they want to identify the people who are struggling and failing only to help them, right? Only to help them. And so it's important that we don't get this impression that, um, that that's a struggle. Seb, I can see you scratching your head. I've not got many more slides. I will hurry up. Um, I want my program to be uh, judged on the end product. So, you know, we all know of programs where everybody looks like uh, that group on the left, uh, stereotypical. 
you know, wearing a blue blazer and Gantt chinos. Um, I want my program to look in terms of its diversity set up a bit like this, but um, real end products that will make an impact wherever they go, whether it's on fellowship or whether it's uh, in training. Um, and how do you judge a great ST3? It's by achieving what their goals are, collectively agreed goals are. If they achieve them, then for me, that's a great ST3. So I'm going to leave you with this, which is a, a, a slide, and, and I quote Martin Luther King a lot um, in terms of having a dream. The truth is all of you have a dream, and it's not just a dream of getting onto an orthopedic uh, program and becoming an orthopedic consultant. It's a bigger dream than that. You all have an ambition of what kind of research you want to do, what kind of educator you want to be, but outside of work, what kind of house you want to live in, what kind of uh, holiday you want to go, where you want your children, if you're going to have children, uh, be educated. But alternatively, if uh, windsurfing or, or horse riding is your passion, then how are you going to be able to do that? It really is worth putting all of that down uh, somewhere in paper. And if you have a great mentor discussing it with them so that you really formulate what your dream is, and the sooner you're able to do that and get clarity, the more successful you will be, but also the more happy you will be. Um, and don't let other people determine what's success for you. That's for you to judge once you've clarified what your dream is. And if you achieve your dream, whatever it is, that's success. Um, so that's me done. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Etchen. That was a great talk. And uh, also thank you very much to Zara and Simon um, for your talk so far. Um, we've got quite a few questions from the audience. So I'm gonna ask a few of them to some people directly and some that are just to the panel at large. Uh, let me just try and pin all of you so everyone can see you at the top. And where's Mr. Etchen gone? Oh dear, hang on. I'll pin them, Seb. You pinned him? Excellent, fine. Okay, so first question we have from the audience. Um, this is to all of you first. Um, if we can get Zara to answer first, then Simon, then Mr. Atchin last. Um, what should I be doing right now to maximize my chances before applications start in December? Uh, Zara, you're on mute. Yeah, I keep forgetting. <laughs> um, I'd probably start with uh, maximising on the scores that can be affected by question one, where they'd be weighted. Um, it's probably where you could end up uh, losing most of the marks potentially because of having an extra year out. Um, I, that's what I did. Everyone's a little bit different, um, but I would just focus on what you can achieve in the short amount of time that you have leading up to applications rather than trying to do anything big and ambitious and putting extra stress on yourself because you do still have a full-time job and you still do have um, other commitments outside of it. Um, and so that will detriment you preparing effectively for the interview later on. You don't want to burn out too early. So um, I think you could pos possibly get a publication in time if it was something you submitted now. Um, but that's, you know, a lot of people take, a lot of journals take ages to review things. And so that might be too much pressure, but I think definitely you could get presentations. Um, you could get, you could get a closed loop audit done potentially depending on what the project is um, or two cycles of a quip. Um, so just have a look and see what, what is attainable for you having gone through the checklist. That's the advice I'd give. Um, yeah, I would, I would echo that. I, I, taking a bigger overview, so I would go through the whole self-assessment and find out where the gaps are and then go, how do I fill those gaps? I would also start building your portfolio yesterday because for everything in that portfolio, whether it's self-assessment, virtual face-to-face, -face, you need evidence and that evidence needs to be good enough. So it can't be like a napkin with a letter from someone going, yeah, I saw this guy, he did some plastering this one time. Um, so building that portfolio, getting that evidence together, making sure that it you know, is legit enough actually takes a lot more time than you think. And I think Zara's right. I, I'm a big believer in working smart, not hard. So look at that self-assessment and go, in the time I have between then and now, where can I maximize my score? And it's always heartbreaking when you hear people being like, well, I've not been to theater, I've not done Nord, I've not done anything, because I'm going to get that paper. And you're like, cool, 
but there's a bunch of other places where you can score points. Uh, Mr. Atchin, what's your opinion on yeah, that? Yeah, no, well, I have to say, I think both of, both of them have nailed it. I think what I would say to all of you is um, you've got to split your time between where your clinical work is uh, and how you can be committed to that and what free time you have to develop your portfolio. To both Zara and Simon's point, absolutely sit down and nail that self-assessment so you know what your score is today and what your timeline is to try and score on there. And then, um, like Simon said, get a portfolio, put all those headings in, and it doesn't matter if they're all blank today, because from tomorrow you can start filling them up. But when it comes to your clinical side, really, it's not just about ticking the logbook stuff. I can tell you there is no substitute for clinical maturity. And I, I've interviewed at great length for SD3s, for fellowships, and also for consultant interviews. And I tell you, at every level, the standout thing is somebody who's clinically mature. And by that, what I mean is they have been in a busy center at whatever level, and they have committed to doing that work. And every scenario you throw at them, they immediately can think of a situation that uh, was absolutely what you've described. And that maturity in their answer comes through. So those are the two sides, uh, you know, so don't shirk one for the other. But absolutely, I think the other guys nailed the uh, portfolio question. I would just I would just add, actually, to, to absolutely echo what Mr. Achan said. Don't forget that there's a whole other interview after the portfolio station. And if you're not doing the job and asking questions and asking people to ask you questions, you'll be like, my portfolio is the best. And then you'll go into the comm skills or the clinical skills or whatever and be like, oh, so don't forget that there's a whole other interview outside of the self-assessment where the interviews are looking for exactly what Mr. Achan described. Great, thanks guys. So next question, uh, maybe direct to Zara. Um, when we're providing evidence of audit completion, what part of the audit needs to be uploaded and will just an audit completion certificate suffice? So what the self-assessment document says is that you, you need to have a summary of the audit. So I'd usually just do a printout of the uh, slides I'd presented. And then you also need what they call an authenticated um, authenticated proof that you've presented it somewhere. So that was for me, usually a certificate that I presented it at local or uh, regional national meeting um, or just a letter from a department head or an audit lead. Great. Um, next one, maybe to Simon. Um, for question one of the self-assessment criteria, um, and I suppose question two as well, do you think the number of months for waiting um, will change over the next year or two, uh, given how COVID's been? So uh, Mr. Achan might actually be able to speak more closely to this because <laughs> he's involved to the SAC. What I would say is, and, and he alluded to this. So when I was part of the selection design group, the design for the next year's interview started the week after the previous year's interviews and it never ends. So the selection design group meet regularly in continuous communication. And at the moment, a lot of things are just up in the air uh, because of COVID and, and the final scoring kind of algorithms tend not to be locked into a little bit closer to the time precisely because, as, as he alluded to, they ask everyone, like, how are your trainees doing? Are they getting their time? How many trainees nationally got pulled out of their surgical job and dumped on a medical ward or, or on ICU or what have you? So the answer for a lot of things at the moment is, I don't know. Okay, fair enough. Um, so I suppose following on from sort of the same topic of uh, duration in practice, um, someone's asked for the self-assessment question too. Let's say you had a six-month honorary contract. Does do you think that will count towards the time in specialty? Again, I, you know, people try to be as fair as possible, um, and certainly when we started this whole process, international or overseas uh, work in any place outside of the UK was not counted. Um, and people really want specifics on what you are doing in these roles as to both whether you're getting training or whether you are moving along. So one of the things they're looking to is whether you're progressing at the rate you'd expect somebody who's a potential trainee to move at. Um, we have seen a massive evolution in that. Initially, 
you know, it was it was old school, uh, I think, by looking mainly at the Commonwealth and saying, well, we'll recognize that job if they did it in uh, Australia, but we're not going to recognize it if they did it in Zimbabwe. Now it's pretty categorical that most uh, time is counted. Most of the evidence that comes from those places, if supported, is counted. Um, but to specifically answer your question, people try and be get as much information as they can. And like I said to you, when we're doing the long listing, there is a forum where somebody will flag up and say, look, I've got this person with an honorary contract. And the question will be, which hospital is it at? Who is the person who's written the reference? What did that job entail? There are honorary contract jobs, maybe at the link to an academic post or because you've come from overseas on a specific type of visa where you're actually doing an awful lot. And there are honorary jobs where you're just observing and actually doing very little. Um, so I don't want to universally say yes or no, but, but basically put as much evidence as you can alongside your application. And this is a point coming back to the question around the audit and even the question to Simon is literally when we're doing it, we have a checklist and we have uh, to get through a hundred of these things. So the more easy it is for us to get that evidence. So when you turn to the audit page where you've self-assessed, but you have one slide with all the certificates with the summary. And if we want to look in any depth, we can find them then we will look at one or two of them. And the minute we see that one or two of them have the evidence, we will give you the marks for all of that summary slide sheet. So just think about if you were the person scoring, how can you put that evidence as clearly conveying as much of the information as possible? Because uh, everyone is trying to support you to get through. That's great, thank you. Um, so I think following on from sort of the same, uh, I think part of the question was already answered, but someone's also asked sort of, how do you overcome the long-term experience of having just been at starting as an international medical graduate in the UK, um, evidencing how you've been working outside the UK, um, how the evidence is considered? Um, any, any more thoughts on that? I don't know if you guys want me to take that because I've probably got more, more experience of it. Mm. I think one of the first things to do, I mean, it's a real struggle if you're an international medical graduate and you come to this country, you've done your PLAB and even sitting your PLAB, you try and get work experience and both the combination of COVID and more restraint on who's allowed into hospitals for various reasons makes it a real struggle for, for, for people to get through. And so um, once they're through, what you need to very rapidly do is get a mentor who's quite senior and involved in training and one or two really reliable friends who are in uh, national training numbers at various levels. And then you need to sit down with them and say, what does the evidence you collect look like? And then you need to look at all the evidence that you have or the things that you have done. And you say, how can I translate this into a document that looks like what a core trainee has in their portfolio, right? And it is a real struggle because you might have a logbook, but the logbook may not be electronic. It may not be sophisticated, but the more able you are to do all of that, the more it will count towards the credibility of your portfolio. That's great, thank you very much. Um, so there's quite a lot of, a lot of people have questions on publications. So um, one of the earliest ones is why are publications that have, um, that have been accepted by some journals not valid? Uh, the time from acceptance to publication can be obviously very lengthy, as I think you've already mentioned, especially with the COVID delays. Um, but if you can prove acceptance for the publication, should it not count? Um, I suppose, Mr. Archon, any insight into that so, or, or Simon? So we, uh, we've touched on this, in fact, all three of us, uh, about how hard people are trying to make it a fair playing surface for everyone. And so you have to draw the line somewhere. What is making it all the more difficult for us is journals are popping up all the time. Um, and although they say they are peer reviewed, this is why PubMed is, is uh, one of the benchmarks that we use. Um, but there are other journals where actually the peer review process actually starts to happen once you've published the, the journal. Um, and so as a, consequent, um, a, as a consequence, I talked to you about this real time thing when we're doing the long listing, but it certainly comes up. Somebody says, look, I've come across this journal. I can't find it in PubMed. And then a bunch of people start to look into it. Um, and basically the design committee then will give us 
uh, for that year's selection process, a very clear line of what is okay and what is not. And you are always going to get a, a handful of people who say, well, that's not fair because I'm below that line. You know, you have got a year with very clear guidelines as to what you need to do to get above that line. And if you are really relying on this to get above your line, uh, I have to say it's highly likely that you will struggle as an orthopedic trainee um, because the good trainees are smashing. Uh, you know, the best trainees who come through this process are knocking out PubMed index, uh, high impact factor publications from when they're at medical school. That's what you're up against. And this isn't about giving everyone a chance. This is about giving the best people the limited number of training numbers we have in orthopedics uh, and you have to step it up. So I think, you know, there are two sides to that. We are as fair as we can be, but, you know, we are not going to make concessions to get someone who's then going to struggle through by, uh, by, by dropping that, that line each time. That's, uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so I think someone else did ask, is only PubMed index journals accepted? I think that's, I think Simon's already posted something about that it is only PubMed ID uh, journals, unfortunately, for some people. Um, so someone's asked, uh, maybe Zari can answer this. Someone's put, how important is it to have publications to get a national training number? I think Mr. Atchin, you sort of touched on that just now with what you just said. Um, I mean, Zara, you, uh, you've come through the process very recently. How important was it to have those publications in your bank? Well, it, it is the, it is sort of the one that you can get the highest Mac number of scores for. So it, out of all of the categories, you can score eight points for it. Um, it is really difficult to get. Um, so, you know, like I said before, if you're trying to get it all done last minute, it's probably not the one to focus on. Um, but in terms of points uh, and how far you'll get it, I think it, it does have a significant weighting. Um, what I would say is, uh, how important is it? I mean, if you can get to that number of uh, the minimum score you need for the interview, you can make up the rest of the points with the rest of the interview, so the other stations. So say you don't have the maximum number of publications, if you can get enough in teaching and the other categories and get yourself that minimum scores, which was 21 in my year, so you have a look and try and get yourself as close to or beyond that, um, you can definitely make up the points later. Thank you. Um, so this Steph, can I add, add something to that? Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, um, one thing I'll say, and I, I hope nobody takes this the wrong way, but I was literally one of these trainees who was pretty rubbish at writing a paper. And I can tell you, if you were like me and you're sitting there with a year to go and you think, okay, I'm going to write a paper, your consultant says, why don't you look at this? I think that's an interesting paper. Then I don't want to promise you, but I pretty much will guarantee you that you will have zero publications when it comes to uh, next year. So what you need to do is you need to identify somebody you work with who knows how to write papers, right? And these people are there. And if you can deliver for them, they will give you some advice. And if you deliver for them, so you first do the literature search or whatever it is, then they will take you through writing your first paper. You may not be first author. If they feel sorry for you, they might put you as first author, but the learning exercise is how to do that, how to write a systematic review, how to do certain things. And I learned that way from one of my colleagues, Mr. Ramachandran, who is a publication machine, um, or, or certainly was when, when we were trainees. I think he's got other stuff that's going on now. But you can learn from someone how to write a paper. And until you do that and you get that under your belt, it is a really, really tough journey to do on your own from a standing start. Okay, so find those people. And if those good people are out there, and if you help them write one paper, they will give you another one, right? And to Zara's point, if you're ever going to get a couple of publications done in a year, that's the route to do it through. And the other thing we haven't touched upon around what you can do to make that research portfolio stronger is recruit to clinical trials. OK, it is something that you can put a piece in in your in your thing that shows you're committed to research. Um, and that is something that's that's very, uh, very pertinent and a quick way of doing things. So we've had a lot of questions on the research. I'll just ask one more from the research section before moving on to something else, because there are a few other topics. Um, but this is essentially about collaborative research. So two people have asked. Um, Collaborative research, do you, do you get points if you're a co-author? And also, if they're PubMed um, ID'd, will you get, uh, will those count towards the scoring? 
So I mean, well, Simon, you... Simon should take this first because I tell you, there are very cynical views from the TPDs, and I'll, I'll follow <laughs> Simon's answer. So this is a, a pretty hot topic, uh, and um, the reason being, and you know, let's let's not beat around the bush. Is some people sign up to a collaborative piece of research, they send one email that is like, I have no data, and they get a paper. However. What we know is from some of the big international RCTs coming out, you know, from the Human Genome Project down, uh, is that collaborative research is the way to go. So at the moment, collaborative research counts, but there is an there's an ongoing debate about whether it should, and if so, whether you would have to not unreasonably evidence what it was you collaborated with and what work you put in, because there's a difference between if you're um, a member of the BOTA committee and you're part of the steering group and you wrote the paper, that's very different to potentially having not actually done very much at all. So there are debates ongoing, but I'm a big believer in collaborative research. I think some of the best studies in ortho in the last couple of years have been collaborative, but it is about recognizing, as Mr. Achan said, we want, we want good people, we want the best people. So how do we make sure that when you say, yeah, I, I was on this massive paper that got into the New England Journal that you, you know, <laughs> did some work. And, and equally to follow that on, how, how, how is it fair that that gets you the same point that somebody who did a bunch of work to get off their own back uh, a, a research paper in a peer reviewed high impact journal, right? So I think where the direction uh, of travel is, I, I don't think anybody would disagree with Simon in terms of the value of collaborative research and that being the future of, of where we need to go. But I think there is going to be, and good people are already doing it, which is an onus of responsibility that if you're part of a collaborative, that you get a letter or letter of support to acknowledge your contribution from the person running the collaborative uh, project. Um, and if you can get that and put it in your portfolio, uh, certainly with last year, that would get you the point um, but if you fail to do that, I think it does get a bit sketchy and there is going to be a time where people say, well, there's so many of these things being churned out. Maybe we'll have to put a bigger spread on the publication uh, bit and collaborative research publication will get you this mark, whereas a, an independent or a, you know, a single effort of a high impact journal is going to get you this. It's all about differentiating in the, in the end. There is, there is no benefit for any of us sitting where I am, where Simon is, where Zara is, or any of the people attending this course, for everyone to end up with the same mark, right? This process is really to spread all of you out fairly to differentiate between the strongest candidate and the weakest candidate. And if the weakest candidate is above our bare minimum line, that is great, right? Because you've done everything you can. But if, essentially, this process has to stretch you all out, um, and that's what it—that—that's the only way it works. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question, interesting question for uh, Mr. Atchin. Um, could the TPD give examples of developing, um, leading yourself, and what is classed as leadership roles that are um, unthreatening, and also give examples of leadership roles seen as threatening in a portfolio? Okay, so for, for the ST3, at the ST3 level, I don't think that there are any leadership roles that would be viewed as threatening, um, you know, whatever, whatever space you were in. Um, that is more of an issue, I think, personally, and again, this is controversial, I think that's more of an issue when you come to your consultant jobs. So if you have done um, higher degrees in leadership um, from very established business schools, say you do... You, you go to uh, Harvard Business School, INSEAD Business School, Kellogg, any of these top, top business schools, and you have a very strong leadership portfolio, then it would not be unreasonable for all of the panel from the CEO down to think that your ambition is to develop as a leader. And for the people in your department and your subspecialty, their first reaction is this person is applying for this job in order to lead me. And it's a human instinct to be threatened by that, right? To answer your question, uh, when you're applying for ST3 roles, it is all about finding the balance. If you are very leadership heavy and you are struggling in the research domain and the teaching domain, and particularly in the clinical domain, then people will worry that 
your priorities for the stage you're at uh, are, are slightly misplaced. Uh, it doesn't make them wrong, um, and I will stress that, but they're slightly misplaced because your journey is, is very much, this is a great example of being a marathon rather than a sprint. Um, whether it's your leadership journey or your clinical development journey in all of the domains uh, that we talk about. And I put them all down as other, but people who are on my program will know that we have a leadership domain, we have a management domain, we have an innovation domain, we have a commercial domain. These are all bits of your portfolio you have to develop, but only once you've got the, the fundamentals started um, in your first couple of years on a training program. Great, thank you very much. Um, so moving on to another topic, similar to the research section, it's about the presentations now instead. Um, so a couple of people have asked about presentations. Firstly, if I had a presentation accepted to a conference, but it was canceled due to COVID, will that still count towards the self-assessment? So, so last year it did, absolutely. If you had a letter of acceptance for a, a presentation and then a letter saying the course that the conference has been cancelled then you got you got the point i think there was another question about presentations which was if there was an international presentation with your name on it but you weren't the first presenter uh, again if, if you've contributed to the piece of work um, and your name's on the international presentation uh, it's recognized um, there is a distinction i think on the points or there has been in the past i don't know what the next uh, iteration will bring between being the person doing the podium presentation and being a co-presenter who didn't. So your name's on the presentation, but you aren't the primary presenter. Uh, and that again can change. So obviously, you know, if you if you contributed to it, you're going to get something. Um, if you were the primary presenter, then you get more. So if you're in that position where you've contributed, see if you can talk to the people who can understand that you need it more and you be the presenter. Uh, but with international presentations and the and the trip, especially if it's somewhere nice, that's a pretty tricky proposition. That fits in with with what I was saying about every. You know, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but every answer Mr. Achan has given always ends with, "You've got to have the evidence. You've got to have the evidence. You've got to have the evidence." And that takes time, right? If you're reaching out to one of your old bosses or someone else, and you're like, "Look, I need a letter and I need a copy of the email that maybe." Maybe if you weren't the one who submitted the piece of work to the conference, so you don't have the acceptance email. So now's the time to start putting all that stuff together so that when Mr. Achan is looking through your portfolio and you say, yeah, I sent something to the American Academy, but I, but I didn't go to the American Academy. You've got all that evidence that shows what work you did and that it was accepted and all that sort of stuff. Because if it's not watertight, I'm not unreasonably going to be like, yeah, they're trying their luck. They got their mate to put their name on a PowerPoint slide. So, so actually, uh, Mr. Atchin, you must be a bit psychic because the next question after that was about if I'd been part of the team presenting an oral presentation at an international conference, but was not the one that did the presentation, does it still count? So yeah. I think we've already answered that one. Um, moving yeah. um, I think, uh, so, I mean, someone else has asked, can you give us a portfolio pre-format PDF so we can prepare ourselves properly? I assume that sort of means like um, an example of what, you know, what your portfolio would have consisted of in terms of the physical copy. I think that obviously might be a bit uh, something we can't really do here, but maybe later on as part of some ST3 preparation, we can maybe have examples of what goes into a portfolio might be helpful. Um, let's see, what else have just, we got Just here? before you go on that, on that topic, just be slightly wary. If people start to say, okay, this is what a portfolio looks like, then everybody's portfolio starts to look the same, right? And if you are good, that doesn't make you stand out, right? So just, just be slightly wary of everything being prescriptive because ultimately you're all individual people and what is going to make you strong uh, as an applicant to this process is how much better you are than your peers, okay? So don't go to, down the line of, of asking people to say, well, can you give us this? And uh, you know, what, what, somebody asked, what conferences can we go to, you know? Try, try and ask your mentors so that it actually is a fairly unique thing rather than something that looks like it's 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 standardized um, because you're you're all not standardized you're all individuals you're all very different and that it, it's that bit that has to come across that is going to make you stand out and people say this this chap or this girl uh, it, you know I'm going to score them a bit higher because they are different in this way. 
And Put I it like in it. I think giving you the titles for the PDF is, is fine, but just very broad titles. No more than that is my advice. To put it in context, I was the first year of national selection and the, the question we got at the portfolio station was, why should we give you a number instead of one of the other 500 people in the waiting room? And actually that's a really powerful question, right? Why, why, should, we, why should we let you join our community? Why should we want you? And so, yeah, be, be wary of becoming a, a cookie cutter orthopod. So just to add to that, um, when I was preparing my portfolio, though no one actually saw it because the interview didn't happen, um, I ended up asking a lot of people uh, what their portfolio looked like. I had a look at theirs and I just went for something that was a kind of com the best of everything I liked in different people's portfolios. So um, I think Mr. Chan's right. Not everyone's portfolio does or should look the same. Um, it really depends on what you like about the way you want to present it. Um, so I would just go with that. Brilliant. Um, so I'm going to do one more question. Then I'll wrap it up. There are going to be, there's quite a few other questions that can be asked, um, need answering, but what we'll do is we'll aim to compile them and get some answers back to you via sort of the website and also online by emails. Um, so I think the last question we'll take for the moment is, are BSCs, masters, PG certs, et cetera, on other courses, um, if they're done online rather than going to campus, are they equally weighted or are they not? Yeah, basically. The, the scoring's the scoring's pretty clear. It says, you know, uh, um, at the time of application, have you completed which is important, and been awarded, which is important, a higher degree or equivalent. And then they say no, master's, PhD, MD. You have to provide a degree certificate. And if it was outside of the UK, so if you did it in another country, you have to provide evidence of its equivalence. Um, but a lot of people do distance learning. A lot of people do the med ed degree from Dundee, and it's one of the most respected degrees in the world. It's about having done it, having completed it, and having that evidence to show that you've done it and completed it. The, the wording on the self-assessment is really anal retentive for exactly that reason. So, you know, the, the people like Mr. Achan who are sat there scoring it, like he said, right, they've got the rules. And if you can evidence that you've evidenced that question, you'll get the points. So, so just one thing, which is a slight oversight by Simon, but was naughty of the person writing the question, is they slipped BSc into that. So MSCs and PG certs online, you don't get anything for a BSc. No. Right. So just to clarify that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Simon's spot on in terms of the online being valid. So um, I, I said that was going to be the last one. There's actually one, the last one that question that just popped up, I think is quite interesting for obviously the ST, uh, STS uh, DHS numbers. Um, validating a logbook, does it have to be electronically validated by the consultant in question or can it be signed by hand by a supervisor instead? Yeah, it can, it can, be, it can be hand signature. Um, yeah, as, well as, we know, as long as we, we know who it is who signed it, and they put all their details down. I think, I mean, traditionally before it was electronically validated, that's how it used to work. And they had to put their GMC number down. So whoever's signing it, if they sign it, put down who they are and then put their GMC number down, that's not an issue. The danger is always, it's just a random signature um, that can't be traced. Um, you know, it's about making your, your portfolio robust, um, you know, as Simon said, it's all about evidence that, that is believable and that will stand up to scrutiny. So it's not just about, uh, you know, you getting a panel who's looking at your portfolio who decide today we're going to be shits to everyone. There is, as Zara pointed out, um, you know, random spot checks on how we're performing and we get that feedback all the time. And they say, God, you know, your scoring is you're giving everyone way too many marks um, when we do the spot checks compared to other groups. Um, or if there's a discrepancy in the scoring between two adjacent markers, if it's a discrepancy of one point, they'll let that go uh, in the interview scenario. But if it's greater than that, it's flagged up. And then somebody comes and looks at our scores and says, why did you score them so differently? So we have to, we have to justify all the stuff. That's outstanding. Well, thank you very much, everyone. This has uh, been a really enlightening talk. I'm sure everyone who's attended uh, feels the same about that. So thank you, Zara. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Mr. Apchan. Um, 
so we'll wrap up the session there because before it gets too late. Um, so also thank you to Leader, who sponsored our teaching series and also to the Royal College who's been affiliated with our uh, teaching series. Um, we're putting the link for the feedback forms up now. So please make sure you fill it in as soon as because um, this will allow us to monitor who's been attending the sessions and allow us to work out who needs the certificates uh, sent out to at the end. This session has been recorded. It will be released uh, very soon. It'll be uploaded on our website seen here, uh, theoperatingnetwork.com. Um, and lastly, just to mention, um, sort of around November time, we're going to start running some additional sessions focused more on the SD3 preparation. Um, we're going to give send out more details about that um, sort of closer to the time, and that will be via both email and social media. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. Thank you very much.